Well, that is a very mature grown-up response. And I want to be clear, this podcast has no interest in grown-ups or maturity. <laughs> okay, so I don't want any more of that the rest of this interview. You understand? <laughs> Damn. That was Brad Davison, and this is On the Bench with Mike Hall. That's me. Brad Davison is one of those guys who seemingly has been around the league for, well, forever. It sure feels that way. The truth is that while he's in his fifth year in the Big Ten, it feels so long because he made an impact right away. As a freshman basketball player at Wisconsin, he was the second leading scorer on the team. And he made a name for himself for his guts as he played for months with a brace on his left shoulder back then. Fast forward to this year, he's the old man on a resurgent Badger team, which is one of the pleasant surprises in the conference thus far. Now, perhaps more than anything, you should know or you do know that as his career grew at Wisconsin, so did the amount of charges he was able to get called on his opponents, which needless to say, is not something that endeared him to opposing Big Ten fans. To start off our chat, I wanted to test his honesty, so I asked him what percentage of the charges he draws are actually charges. Depends on who you ask, but since you're asking me, uh, I'd say 95% of the charges are actually charges. You don't believe by definition. that. You don't believe that. Absolutely. Not a doubt in my mind. Well, you know how to milk it, though, right? Oh, absolutely. That's part of taking a charge. You know, you okay, got you got to be in the right keys. position. You got to take the contact and you got to make it look like you really got the contact in order to get the call. Okay. So when did you learn how to milk it the right way? So when I was younger, we played um, charge. Taking charges was a big deal on my youth sports teams. So my parents were actually the coach coached me all the way up and they coached my sisters and kind of throughout our like youth basketball association, from like fourth to eighth grade, if you ever took a charge, your reward was a Dairy Queen Blizzard. So from a young age, first of all, I fell in love with take, with Dairy Queen Blizzard. So that means I fell in love with taking charges. And that's how they kind of two tied together. Um, but unfortunately, Coach Guard doesn't give out Dairy Queen Blizzards like my mom and pops did. He's got to change that. I mean, that's got to change. And that's why I came back for my fifth year to try to make that rule change. <laughs> What, besides the Pavlovian reflex of knowing a charge equals a blizzard, what is it you love about drawing a charge? I really think it's a, a taking a charge is a big momentum swing in a game. You know, similar to a slam dunk on the offensive end where everyone celebrates, the crowd gets into it. Um, you won't really see me getting a whole lot of slam dunks throughout a game, <laughs> but then defense, I'd say the defensive uh, synonym for a slam dunk, is kind of like taking a charge. You know, it's a turnover on the other team. It's a foul on the other team. Also, it gets your ball coming back, and the whole crowd gets into it. The team gets jazzed up. Um, and taking charges is something we really pride ourselves on here at the um, University of Wisconsin. Is there anything you can do vocally that helps draw a charge, or is it all body and positioning? I think it's all body and positioning. You know, when we work on charges in practice, Coach always says, you know, let them, let them hear it. Let them know it. For me, I don't really let them hear it. I just show it. You know, I just try to get in the right position and put my body in the line and uh, hope for the best. Basketball is such an interesting sport because, like, as someone who doesn't play it at a high level, like, there's that, there's a line of winning at all costs versus doing something that can be seen as cheap or dirty. Like, where is that line? I, I think it kind of depends on who you talk to and who you ask. That's everyone's kind of individual line. Uh, for me, I try to do everything I can to help my team win. You know, I try to play with maximum effort, maximum energy, diving on the floor, diving off of loose balls. Um, and again, and just trying to prioritize my team and prioritize winning games. Um, so for me, um, I just try to do everything I can again um, to help my team be successful. What would you say your perception is across the league? Again, it probably changes by who you who you ask. Who, who you ask that question to? That's one thing that I've learned over time is that people's perspectives and people's opinions, you know, they're personal and they're right to them. But also, ultimately, I know that they're not truth. Um, and so, for my truth, I know where my truth comes from. Um, and as a man of faith, I know that I am defined um, by God and only by God. And that means that I'm a child of God. And I'm, um, you know, that's the opinion and the what I value and the, the opinion that I take worth in. Um, you know, I try to play for first and foremost, God, and then my 
coaches, my family and friends and my teammates. And so that's what I prioritize. And that's the perception or the opinions that I really value and care, care about. Um, but everyone else is entitled to their own opinion. It doesn't necessarily mean it's truth all the time. Well, that is a very mature grown-up response. And I want to be clear, this podcast has no interest in grown-ups or maturity. <laughs> Okay, so I don't want any more of that the rest of this interview, you understand? <laughs> deal, deal, deal. Okay. Do you think there are some fan bases who see you as a villain? Oh, I would probably, a, a lot of them do. Um, yeah. You know, I think that's one thing that everyone talks about how we missed out on the home crowds and the home advantage. It was really odd for me last year because I didn't get booed or heckled anywhere. <laughs> and so you'd think people would say that's refreshing, but for me, I kind of missed out on it because at the end of the day, I think it's kind of a sign of respect. It's kind of a sign of, um, you know, a hat tip to say. Um, but I think there's there's a few fan bases out there that, you know, Brad Davidson is down on their top five most well-liked athletes. Do, do you have to learn to like being booed and being a villain? Because, like, I, we're all – the human side of us, we all want to be liked. But at, at, is it something that just naturally happens or is it something you have to, like, no, no, being booed is a good thing. That means I'm getting under their skin. I have to enjoy this. <laughs> No, for me, I, some people say you got to buy into it and you got to like feed off of it. For me, I, I personally, I try to tune it out and just focus on my team and I focus on my coaches and my game and the plan that we have to execute. Um, so this might, again, this might be more of a mature answer. I don't want I it. I don't want <laughs> yeah. it. I don't want it. Uh, but I, I really try not to feed into it. And so at the end of the day, I know the things that I can control. And that's, again, my effort, my attitude, the way I encourage and lead my teammates. So I really try to keep tunnel vision and stay focused on the things that I can control. Um, with that being said, for the people that say that they don't hear it and they block it out, that's not true. Like you hear all of it, you hear the personal things, you hear the boos, you hear the heckles. Um, and when you can get over, when you can be, get to the point where you don't see it as like demeaning and derogatory, but you see it as kind of like a mutual respect thing that you get used to. And now, you know what, it's part of the game to you. It comes with part of the territory. You can use it to your advantage. How much do you talk? on the court? I rarely talk. Uh, yeah. I don't really talk at all. I talk a lot to my teammates. Uh, if you, if you hear me play, I usually, I lose my voice after most games, but it's all from my teammates to my teammates. Um, the only time I really talk is if there's, you know, I have buddies on the other team. Um, and it's usually not talking smack. It's more just, uh, you know, little, little conversations here and there. Who does talk smack? On my team or throughout the league? Yes. Both. Yes. Um, well, from my team, I don't really know if I can tell you yet because I haven't got the chance to really play with this young group of guys against other teams. Right. Um, and so in practice doesn't count. It's a different kind of talking for talking in games and in practice. So TBD on my teammates, I do <laughs> talk a lot. Um, but throughout, and again, the league's going to look so different this year. So I might have to do the blast from the past with some. Yeah, go give me, give me about. a past one. That's fine. Um, man, the people that talk the most. Uh, one guy that I have become close with throughout my career here, Trent Frazier at Illinois, he talks quite a bit um, on the court. Um, who else would I say talks a lot? Again, I don't engage in a lot of it. And so if people talk to me, I don't respond to them. So therefore, they kind of see that they're not, that, that's not how our relationship is going to go when we're on the court. So I don't right. really get a lot of that smack talk from other individuals. Um, but Trent, we yeah. had a really good, pretty good relationship. So I'd say Trent. But I was going to say, like, you could be, I mean, this is before your time, but, like, Draymond liked to talk, and he might not have guarded you, but there's no way you wouldn't have heard him talking. There had to be guys like that in the league over the years, right? Not really. Not to that yeah. Draymond level that stick out to me. Again, like I kind of said, I try to tune out a lot of things when I play basketball and just focus on my team. So, um, you know, if you ask someone else on my team or other people around the league, they might have a better answer for you than me. <laughs> All right, so when you found out you could come back for a fifth year, what was your first thought? My first thought was just of gratitude. Um, because for me, when I was growing up, I never had the desire to play professional basketball. I never wanted to go to the NBA or go overseas or go to the G League route or do anything like that. My like epitome climax of my own playing career was I wanted to play college basketball at the highest level. Um, and so from my perspective, the first thing I thought I was like, wow, I have this unique opportunity to live out my dream one more time. Um, again, a lot of other factors go into that decision, but that was kind of my first response was like, wow, what a gift um, that this could be if I choose, choose to make that decision. Yeah. When you told guard you wanted to come back, was he like, no, thanks. You're too old. 
<laughs> no, he was pretty excited. Um, so at the end of our season, I actually, um, so we went to the NCAA tournament, we're in the bubble for a long time in Indianapolis. Um, and we beat North Carolina and then we lost to Baylor, unfortunately, in the second round. Um, and I actually, we drove home from, from Indianapolis back to Madison. I got back in my car, picked up my now fiance, and we drove all the way to Florida to meet my parents. And we had a little road trip. And I spent three weeks in Florida, just, uh, you know, away from Madison, away from the game of basketball, um, you know, away from our basketball, part, away from everything college basketball, just to spend some time of just reflection and thinking about, um, and first of all, just reconnecting with family and friends. You know, that was the first time that we really got to be with each other over the last six months throughout that bubble-ish season, you want to say. Um, so the coaches were very supportive and encouraging me just to take some time away um, become one with my thoughts and after reflection, um, figuring out what I wanted to do. And so then they're really supportive and obviously very excited about my decision to come back for another year. You mentioned the weird bubble. What was the weirdest part? Like the, the story that you're like, I can't believe this actually happened. I feel like every game has that weird story where, you know, your team goes on an amazing run and the other team calls timeout, which is usually when the Cole center is like, everyone's standing the music's blaring yada 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 and you come back to the huddle and you sit down and everyone's like taking deep breaths and you can like hear each other breathe and you can like hear the the shoes squeak of the ref walking by and it's like oh yeah there's absolutely nobody here it's not as cool of a moment as it usually is um, so there's a lot of little moments like that throughout the year um but for me i would say one thing that again is really important to me is my family and my friends and our relationships so whether it's after a win, after a loss, you know, you just go right back to the locker room and go right back home. <laughs> there was no mom and dad there to say hi. There was no little kids from the community to hang out with. There was no, you know, significant others there. It was really just basketball, 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 which is one thing I learned is when you strip away everything else around the game and it's just the game, it can become a little bit of a drag or a little bit more of a job over time. Um, so I would say the biggest thing was first just the eerie silence and then the lack of interaction with your family and friends. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that, that it's a reminder of what makes college sports so cool is the environment, the campus, the atmosphere. It's just Absolutely. different than when you're going to a job, which a pro career can, can certainly be. Um, I want to focus very briefly on your team this year with one question. Tell me how good Jonathan Davis is going to be in his time in Madison. He's going to be a stud. Uh, his ability to get from point A to point B in a snap of the fingers is really impressive. Uh, you know, he's definitely like a downhill dominant attacker. Um, you know, every time he catch, touches it, you know, he's a threat to get to the rim and finish, not a, finish over somebody and on somebody. So definitely someone that I'm excited to play with and just see his growth throughout the year. Um, you know, he's going to be a great weapon for us and we're, we're excited to team up and get after it. Do you see your role this year as like, part player, part pseudo coach because you've been around so long? Or is it like, no, no, I'm just focusing on playing. And, and if there's mentoring that needs to happen, the coaches are going to do it. I'm just worried about ball. Uh, I'm trying to trying to take advantage of kind of that mentor side of things. So, cause there's, these are drills that I've done <laughs> hundreds of times throughout the last four years that I've been here, where a lot of these guys, it's their first time doing these drills or getting a lot of reps in these drills. Um, so when I was younger, I was like, I got to be on the court. I got to be on the court. I got to do every drill, every rep. Where now I kind of take a step back and kind of play behind the scenes sometimes and help mentor and allow the younger guys to get reps. And because uh, I also want to be a college basketball coach someday. So it's a really good experience for me moving forward in my career um, that I want to take advantage of now. But with that being said, you know, once we get past these inner squad scrimmages and these closed scrimmages and the ball goes up real, uh, then it's go time. Then it's back to, you know, just playing ball and again, leading and mentoring. But that's something that I always try to take advantage of, you know, no matter how old I am. <laughs> But with that being said, I just turned 22. So we need to get this narrative out of there that I'm not I'm not that ancient. Oh, yeah. You're a you know spring I mean? chicken. Yeah, come on. Exactly. You're, you're <laughs> tired of people thinking you have a cane to walk around yeah, with. Yeah, yeah. That I've been here for eight years. This is my fifth year. Just turned 22. I've just, I've just played in quite a few games. That's, that's the narrative. Not that I'm that old. <laughs> right. That's fair. Although, you are old enough for my next question, mm. which is, I have a friend um she used to be an analyst here on our network for women's basketball she used to play for indiana have you heard of her her name is tyra bus i have i'm actually her biggest fan so yes yeah. i've heard of her and i am her biggest fan 
You mentioned earlier you are engaged, and it is to Tyra, a former Indiana basketball player. Give me the story. How'd you guys first meet? So we actually first met, which kind of ties in Big Ten Network into our, you know, romance relationships, you could say. Um, but so she actually got a message from an individual that said, Tyra, I loved watching you play in the Big Ten. I love watching you commentate in the Big Ten. I've also spent a lot of time in the Big Ten. One of my highlights has been interacting and interviewing Brad Davison. What's your highlight then? And so this individual was trying to, you know, get to know Tyra and talk to Tyra. But instead of her responding to that message, she actually took a screenshot of that and sent it to me and said, thought you might like to see this. And then one thing led to another. I got her number. We started texting. That led to FaceTiming. Um, and we realized that we realized that we have a lot of the same values and beliefs and interests and realized that we were very compatible. So we met up for the first time, spent a week in the Dells with her and her family. And 10 months later, bought a ring. 14 months later, we got the wedding date planned. We're good to go. Okay. Yeah. There's a lot there. But first off, <laughs> let, the, let the record show she reached out to you. She was she slid into my DMs. Just set that record straight right there. <laughs> Don't you ever let her forget that. She came uh, to you. She sought out you. Yeah, there you go. There you go. But I will say I am I am the lucky one. So pretty so, amazing. How funny too that it happened in social media because if I'm not mistaken, that was was that before the pandemic or while the pandemic had already started? This was the summer. So Actually, another funny story that goes along with this is my, so her whole family is from the Dells. And so her whole family is big Badger fans, Badger basketball, Badger football, and she's obviously a Hoosier. And so we, my junior year, we won the Big Ten Championship regular season right before COVID shut down. And we actually won the game at Assembly Hall against Indiana to win the Big Ten Championship. And her, her two brothers and her dad were at that game celebrating her dad's birthday. And they actually took a selfie. They're all wearing Badger gear, except she's wearing Indiana gear. They're taking a selfie and the Jumbotron's in the background. And it's as I'm shooting the game-winning free throw to seal the Big Ten Championship. So I'm like in their family picture. And so it was about a month or two months after that Big Ten Championship, like after the end of March, it was in June, early July when she messaged me. Um, so just at the beginning of the COVID shutdown. Wow. Okay, so... I got married when I was in my young 30s, and I dated my now wife for like three years. Okay. You had 10 months? <laughs> yeah. 10 months? That is quick by man. How did you, like at what point did you go, all right, we're done, lock it down? Yeah, you know, that was something that we, we wanted to be really intentional with from the start. Um, and so we spent, you know, two to three months getting to know each other via you know, texting and FaceTiming. And then we, when we got to meet for the first time, that was something that a conversation we had is, you know, we didn't want to do casual dating. We wanted to intentionally be with each other. So what that meant is we wanted to, um, you know, date with the end in mind and think, you know, if we're going to stay together and be together, it's because we want to get married and we want to spend the rest of our life together. So if there's ever a moment where we're not there or things aren't adding up, let's, let's, let's save each other the heartache. Let's make it easy on each other and stop it there. Um, but thankfully, uh, it just continued to build. Our relationship continued to grow and develop and strengthen with one another. Um, and so, I, I mean, I knew just a couple months after we were together that that was, that was my goal and my intention. It was just a matter of when, what type and when I was going to buy the ring. Right. Plus, you know, she was into you. She reached out and contacted you first. So Exactly. exactly. I had the leg up. I had the leg up the whole time. <laughs> How did you propose? So, actually, I proposed in, the, in Wisconsin Dells. Um, at a place called the Summer House Bar and Grill. Um, and to this day, it's the most planning I've ever done for anything in my life. And it probably will be the last time I planned that much. Somehow we pulled it off, um, surprised her with, so actually there's a, both of her brothers coached their high school basketball team in Mount Carmel, Illinois. And in the Dells, they had um, a summer, bas summer basketball team camp that their, their team was coming to play at. And so she just thought that her two brothers and her, um, her two brothers and her dad were coming up to watch the tournament. Um, but actually behind the scenes, I had it planned where my parents, her mom, her grandma, her nana, her aunt, her cousins, everyone was actually coming. Um, and so we surprised her with everybody. We got her nails done. I had her friends in Milwaukee help her get her nails done. We got her in a white dress. Um, and so we were all at this, I'll give you the abbreviated story, but we're all at the summer house bar and grill sitting on the patio. 
And we had arranged with the owners of the um, restaurant to put speakers around the patio and have a table reserved for us. And we actually have a song. It's called My Person by Spencer Crandall. Look it up, great song. Um, but we have a tradition kind of. It was when it was her birthday, we were in Florida and there was a live artist playing and he was taking song requests. And we went and asked him, will you play My Person? He said, the only way I'll sing it is if you guys stand up in front of the whole restaurant and dance to it. And she was like, yeah, oh, we're not doing it. We're not doing it. But Got her to do it. And so it was a really awkward, but cool moment for us. And so what happens when we were at dinner, you know, all the music shut off and they started playing that song on the speakers all the way around the restaurant. And it worked perfectly. Brad, Brad, it's our song. It's our song. It's like, oh, tradition. All right, we got to dance. Let's go. We got to dance. And she's like, no, no, no. But we ended up getting her up to dance in the middle of the dance floor by the lake. And so as we were dancing, I like twirled her around and look at the patio and her whole family walked out of the patio and I got down on a knee behind her and I wasn't sure if I surprised you or not, but then when the tears started to fall down her face, I knew I did it to perfection. So a lot of people helped me pull it off, but to this day, it's probably, I am most proud of somehow pulling off that surprise. She's not the easiest girl to surprise. That's good, man. That's, that's well done. Yeah. Um, all right. You guys seem perfectly happy and in love. Let me try to mess with that. Let me get you in trouble. All right, I'm going to give you a series of sports. You're going to tell me who's better. You were uh -huh. talking. Okay. Tennis. Tyra. Oh, that was quick. I thought you'd put up a fight. Pickleball. No, it's, it's, it's not even close. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, pickleball. Tyra. Bags. We're pretty close, but Tyra has the leg up at the moment. Darts. Brad. Okay. Uh, throwing a spiral on a football. She has a she has a great arm, but there's levels to this, Brad. <laughs> Basketball. <laughs> what are we, are we playing one-on-one -on -one shooting competition? What are we doing here? Yeah, yeah, one-on-one. -on -one. Again, there's levels to this, Brad. There you go. I respect that. <laughs> I respect that. <laughs> but with that being said, it's one of the things that I love and value so much about. We have so much fun and we're so competitive. In everything we do, we have a blast. <laughs> well, I know something you're much better than than she is at, uh, making up words to country music songs. Yeah, thanks, Tyler. She says uh, you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I so I love to sing. I love to sing, but I'm not I'm not great at it. But I just love the vibe. Like I love singing it. And even if I don't know the songs, I'll just kind of like make it up and hum and take some breaks in and out of the verses that I know. You know, just trying to, trying to have a good time, but she loves to call out my imperfections in my singing, so. Yeah, I'm sure that'll go away over time. I'm yeah, sure. No chance, no <laughs> chance. Here's another thing she told me. Um, you have a gift away from the basketball court. You can tell how many letters are in a sentence when someone says it. 17. Wait, I want to test you, but how did this start? I want to test you, 14. <laughs> All right, uh, here's one, ready? Hi, my name is Brad Davison, and I am a basketball playing machine. Okay, so there's rules to this. There's rules. Oh, no! Hi, my name is Brad Davison, is 21. <laughs> but so here, okay, so here's how this started. I should have never told her that I did this when we first met. Um, I loved math. Like I was really, I really enjoyed math when I was in school, but I, I was kind of ahead of my class. So I got a little bored in class. And so I tried to challenge myself okay. to the point where like, I would just start counting letters that the professor, that the teacher was saying or things that were going on. Um, and so if you said like, hi, my name is Brad Davison, like that's 21, but my limit is 34. So I'm not trying to like think that hard because oh. 34 is my favorite number. So if you get to a statement that's over 34 i just stop it now is this you just you didn't learn how to do more than this or your brain says that's all i got 35 is out of the question my brain just says let's no nah, we're good we're good to go okay so is this like something where at any point during the day you'll be talking to someone and and they'll say something and in your head you're like 24 up oh, 31 <laughs> 16 it's when i it's when i get bored so like it sounds bad i i love school but in class i do it a lot just like it pass time you know um or it's like if someone brings it up so now that you've now that, 
now that you've brought it up, it's like a habit. So I won't stop doing it until somehow my mind gets away <laughs> from counting your letters. Okay, so I've so ruined- I'm really engaged with what, you're, with what you're saying, but I'm also probably gonna be counting your letters for a little bit. But there's a chance I've ruined the rest of this podcast for you. There's a chance, 13. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last, last uh, uh, insight I got from Tyra for you. Yeah. Chicken fettuccine Alfredo. That's the go-to pregame meal. The day before every game? Night before every game. Chicken fettuccine Alfredo from Tudo's Pasta here in Madison. Shameless plug. Great place. <laughs> how, how did that start? So, I mean, like when we were in high school, in football and basketball, we'd always do pasta parties and like pasta feeds the night before games. So when I got to college, you know, we'd have like team meals or we'd do certain things, but they weren't pasta. So I was like, well, in my mind, I was like, I got to get back to this, like my high school regimen. And so I just always try to get chicken fettuccine. Um, and that's my favorite place here in Madison. And it's just down the road from my apartment and it works out pretty well. The owner, the owner and the management is great people too. So it's fun to go down there. But what do you do on road games? Road games, I usually bite the bullet and eat whatever we have. But with that being said, we're treated very, very well on the road and the, the food's usually delicious. <clears throat> Again, very professional and mature. I'm not interested in that. <laughs> <laughs> thought we went over this uh let me ask you about a memory i have and you correct me where i'm wrong okay. i think it was your freshman year you were playing with a back brace or something on your left shoulder because your shoulder was like popping out you dislocated it in the game against michigan state in the second half the doctor popped it back in and 23 seconds later you returned to the game and you didn't even check in with greg guard you just walked right past him and checked in. How much of that is true? All of it, except for the back brace. It was strictly just a shoulder brace, but it looked like a bulletproof vest. Okay. Um, and 23 yeah. seconds later, A, and not even checking with the coach, B? Yeah, very valid. I think, I think I tapped him on the shoulder just to let him know that I was making my way towards the board. So he had, so he had time to tell me who I was getting. Uh, um, it was in the middle of the game. It was actually senior night. So there's always a little bit more on senior night. You want to send your seniors out with a win. And I was really eager to get back into the game. But with that being said, that was also the last game of the year. And so that shoulder situation, I was something that I'd been dealing with throughout the year. So the fourth game of the year um, against Baylor in our Thanksgiving tournament, I went up to get a high low pass trying to get a steal. And the Baylor post player got the ball before me and ripped my arm down with it. And I fully dislocated my shoulder into my chest. Um, and that was the fourth game of my freshman year. And we also, in that game, it was in the early in the second half. And I went back into the locker room and our trainers and our doctors were working on it and they ended up popping it back in. Um, and then I just had to do a bunch of these different, they weren't going to let me go back into the game, but I was telling them that I thought I was physically capable to go back in and perform. And they said, no, you're not, you're not. You got to pass all these different tests. I was like, okay, well, give me the darn test. Like I'm going to pass the test. We're good to go. And, and the so, test was how many letters are in this sentence? Yeah, how many letters? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> 31, by the way, but now <laughs> you had me off of it, but we'll keep going. Um, and see, now you got me hooked back into it. But anyways, so that, that rhythm of popping my shoulder out in a game and then coming back, that actually happened in nine different games throughout the year before that Michigan State game. So I was kind of a veteran at the whole having it pop out, sprint to the locker room, lay down on the chair, get it yanked back into the place pass all those tests and then try to get back to the floor as fast as possible. Um, so that's the part of the story that people don't know is that I had become pretty experienced with that whole situation to know that as soon as I could get back onto the bench, I would be going back into the game. So I was just, just saving coach guard some time. He's got enough things to worry about. He doesn't need to worry about me and my shoulder during the game. <laughs> all right, Brad, before we go, we're going to do before you go four questions unrelated to anything whatsoever. Perfect. Number one, greatest book you've ever read? Lead for God's sake. Um, it's the only book I've ever read from start to finish without putting it down. Or like, <laughs> that was the only, I've finished it in one day and it's because I was coming back from, it's called Athletes in Action Captain's Academy. And I had a flight delay, a bus, missed a bus. I was just at the, at the airport for six hours. So why not just finish the book? Um, and still to this day, I still have a wristband that says lead for God's I, favorite book. I highly recommend it. Number two, go-to snack. 
go-to snack would be meat, cheese, and crackers or apples and peanut butter. What kind of apple? I am not picky. If I had to choose, it would be the um, – What's the what's the really expensive one? The honey crisp? Honey crisp, honey crisp. So good. But again, I only get that when I go home. And I'm only home a couple of weeks throughout the year, so I make sure my parents buy it. I don't buy those here in Madison. <laughs> All right, number three. Give me the scouting report on Brad Davis and the high school quarterback. He really wanted contact. Uh, so if he's running with the football, he was not sliding. He was lowering his shoulder. He was not running out of bounds. If it's third and three or less, he was calling quarterback sneak at the line. Um, and if it and if it was in spread, he really liked to get the ball out of his hands quick and let his receivers make plays. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there if Paul go. Christ comes calling. I'm ready to go. I'm always here. I'm always just down the road. Good answer. Number four, funniest thing you have ever seen an opposing student section say or do to you. I don't know if this, I don't have a thing necessarily. And I don't, this isn't necessarily funny because there was a lot of emotions involved. But my sophomore year, we went at Western Kentucky. And so I'm not, Western Kentucky doesn't like me very much because my freshman year, I took a, there was 0.1 seconds to go and we were underneath our own hoop. And I took a charge when they were running the baseline. If you remember this play, they called it a charge. It was a tie game. So I went down and made the free throws to win the game. And they were like on the bubble one game away from making an NCAA tournament. So I think it's my fault because of the game they lost in December. But anyways, so I go there and I got booed from the moment I stepped on the floor for pregame warmups. Like during my stretches, they cheered when I missed shots during warmups and booed if I made the shot warmups. Like the whole time I was getting heckled. And our parents, like our, our seat tickets we got were right next to the student section. So my parents were right next, basically in the student section, hearing everything that was said. So now, thankfully for me, I'm on the court. I can't hear all the details. And like I said, I tune it out. But my mother, on the other hand, definitely hears everything that is said. And so after the game, um, we actually lost the game, unfortunately. Individually, I, had, I, played, I played pretty well. And we, I came out, of the, came out of the locker room after the game to give my parents a hug. And my mom was like in tears. And I was like, it's just a game, mom. Like, it's a non-conference game. We'll be okay. Like, it'll get better. And she's like, she's, I just want you to know, like, how much I love you and value you and the people that know you, how much they love you and value you. Because the things these people say are not true. And I was like, oh, I don't even want to know what was said. But I prayed for my mother and for that whole situation because um, there's certain things people say, you know, you can develop tough skin, but it's the people close to you that actually read them and hear them and have to yeah. live it too. Um, so it's not necessarily funny, but with perspective, it's pretty funny. That's a, that's a mom response for you right yeah, there. Absolutely. For sure. Uh, that was really fun, Brad. Thanks for the time. And mostly, good luck counting letters this year. Thank you very much. 31. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's Brad Davison, engaged to a former Big Ten Hooper, drawing charges left and right, and counting letters all along the way. My thanks to Brad for joining me, and thank you for listening. From the Big Ten Network in Chicago, I'm Mike Hall. We'll talk to you next time.